This is David Duchovny, and you're listening to Booked. I like the way I said Booked. Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. We have a awesome treat for you. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be interviewing author Max Berry, who we uh, just uh, reviewed his book, Providence. Before we jump into it, uh, here is his bio. Max Berry is the author of numerous novels, including Jennifer Government, Company, Machine Man, and Lexicon. He's also the developer of the online nation simulation game Nation States. Prior to his writing career, Barry worked at the tech giant HP. He lives in Melbourne, Australia with his wife and two daughters. Max, thanks for joining us again and congratulations on release day for Providence. Oh yeah, thank you so much. It's been a while between books, but I finally got a new one out. <laughs> All right, so uh, what we usually do on the podcast when we've reviewed a book and then we talk to the author is we spent you know a good hour telling uh, our audience what we think the book's about, um, but we always like to give you a, an opportunity to just give it to us in in your own words. So, do you have a like an elevator pitch kind of thing for what Providence is? Right. Well, I'm not sure about explaining the book to people who have already heard it uh, talked about for an hour, but uh, how I would describe it to someone <laughs> who had not heard of the book before is um, that it's set a couple of hundred years in the future. It's about what happens next after humanity encounters um, or makes first contact with an alien species that turns out to be tremendously hostile. And what that starts with is humanity uh, very quickly pouring every available resource into building five um, gigantic battleships. Uh, and now because it's the future, um, uh, it's the battleship is run mostly by technology. There's very little need for people to do very much at all. Um, and the crew is just four people who are then slingshot out into space uh, and find themselves a very long way from everyone else. Um, and it's about their attempt to carry out their mission, um, which seems very simple in the beginning, but becomes increasingly complicated. You mentioned technology running the ship. One of the things that, that we found kind of interesting is how you handled um, the artificial in intelligence so of late obviously there's there's a, a debate on you know people who think ai is the future and everything will be better and then there are the you know the doomsayers that ai is going to be the end of us how does the book reflect your feelings on ai i guess they're saying is should we trust the robots or not right well i think both of those viewpoints are absolutely true like ai is amazing and it will be uh, just extraordinary in, in the advances it will allow us to make and, and the benefits it will bring us. But it is also terrifying in that we don't really understand it. And I should explain here, I'm coming at it from a very geeky point of view because I am a hobbyist programmer. I have been since I was a kid where I've just uh, um, always loved programming computers. I got a Commodore 64 when I was a kid. And like most of us um, back then, we sort of grew up with this love of tinkering with computers and making them do what we want. And when you do that, what you discover is that you, the way programming works is you explain to the computer what you want it to do. And then it does exactly what you asked it to do. And you realize, oh, actually, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean do that forever. I didn't mean do that 10 million times. But the computer just followed my instructions and, and went ahead and did it. So it's, um, it's, it's really interesting to me that we are at the birth of this new intelligence uh, and, and what that is, you know, whether you consider it to be uh, a simple machine or a simple program or whether it's going to emerge as something more than that. Um, either way, it's it's this black box and we kind of project onto it. We don't we don't have any way of getting the true feelings of the AI or the computer. We don't have any way of um, relating to it as another human. But what we can do is what humans always do, which is project our own ideas about uh, what it must be thinking or what it must be feeling. We translate what we see from the computer into our own language. Uh, so we um, we have this enormous tendency to anthropomorphize uh, the uh, almost anything we see, anything inanimate will... Um, we will try to put in terms that we can understand in, in like uh, in terms of feelings and emotions. So um, what I find really interesting about AI is that um, it's so powerful and yet it thinks in a way that is completely alien to us. And in the book, I don't really attempt to um, 
to explain how the AI thinks. I just present it as this unknowable, um, almost alien creature. Uh, and the crew is is attempting to interact with it in human ways, but they can never really be sure of what they're getting back and, and what it really means in terms of the AI's true intent. And that's basically how I see it. I see the AI um, that we're going to get to know in the future, in the real world, as something pretty unknowable. And yeah, I, I do find it terrifying. I do think it um, pr- uh, has a reasonably good chance of bringing down humanity in, in some way or another. Like I'm an optimistic guy, but I think that uh, there's nothing quite as scary as um, as an exponential graph. And, and that's what you get with AI as well. You get this um, out of control force uh, that once the genie's out of the bottle, it can be very hard to put back in. So, yeah, I think it's terrific, but it also scares the crap out of me. Um, I love all of that. And uh, one of the things that happened in our discussion, which I apologize, you didn't get to hear our review before we talked to you, um, was talking about the idea of um, is uh, because the, even in the, the synopsis for the book, it talks about how like the, the ship is less reliable uh, or, you know, something to that effect. Anyway, what I'm getting at is um, the, the the question that we, we we were batting around in our discussion was, was the ship doing something it wasn't supposed to or were the human people just not understanding what was going on so that was a cool kind of up in the air thing was you know was it was it that something really was going wrong or were they just not understanding why the ship was doing what it was doing and that was a cool element to the book yes yeah and that that's a big part of it too in that there are these people in the book who are trying to understand First of all, they're trying to understand the enemy to a degree because they know that the enemy is this is some kind of alien species that seems really aggressive for no real reason. Uh, and that regardless of the motivations that the enemy has, we have to win this war for the survival of our species. Uh, but there is there are a few questions that a couple of the crew in particular have about who the enemy really is, why the aliens act the way that they do. And they also have those questions for the ship itself. Uh, And to a degree, they also have them for each other as well. And one thing I really enjoyed with this book was the opportunity to tell a story through the eyes of four different people who are seeing the same events and who agree on maybe 95% of what's happening, but they they explain it in slightly different ways and the ship and the enemy and each other appear to you as the reader in slightly different ways too, depending on whose, whose chapter you're reading in that book. So um, I love the idea of connecting individuals to a larger force, I guess. Uh, And so the, the fact that you've got these four people is such a small intimate kind of story. Um, But I wanted to connect it also to the much wider story of uh, what's happening in the in the in the book? What's happening with the war and why the why we really are in this conflict? Uh, but also what it means for us to be the the carriers of our genes? Because I found this really interesting concept in a, a book I read a long time ago called um, Genome by Matt Ridley, and it um, it explains in really simple language. It's a it's incredibly readable book, but it explained really well how genes are really the drivers of so much human behavior that we're not really aware of or that we ascribe to ourselves as make, as individuals exerting free will and making conscious choices. Uh, a lot of that we think we're, we're in complete control of, but actually if you look further down, you can see that we're driven by the commands, these genetic commands that are that are deep inside of us. And they're not, you know, we're not following them blindly. We do have some free will, but we have less than we think. Uh, and so to a degree, we are these gigantic warships for our genes who are trying to expand their own conquests uh, over each other. So we're part of this conflict that we don't even really um, understand or we're not even really aware of to a large degree, but it is going on all around us. Uh, it's been going on for millions of years and it will go on after each of us have passed. So there is this whole universe of force out there and of conflict. And yet, um, the interesting part of it is always the individuals within that. So, uh, what I really wanted to do with this book was to take four characters who are having an individual journey but also weave them into this much wider story, uh, which is largely happening in the background, but this much wider um, 
network of of force and conflict that's been going on um, forever. Um, I definitely believe that that came through uh, very well in the book, especially from the the Gilly Gilly characters uh, point of view, at least like the the bigger concept of that, um, which is pretty cool. You mentioned the that book Genome. Were there any specific influences that uh, you had when you were writing Providence? Obviously that book, but anything else? Because it's definitely like a very sci-fi book and I could like things come to my mind, but I'd like to hear if you had um, any specific influences when you were writing this. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly a lot of this came out of my just simple love of space stories and alien stories as a teenager primarily, because Man, I read so much of that stuff when I was younger. I I just could not get enough stories with spaceships and aliens in them. And, um, yeah, thinking about any in particular, I guess, um, boy, I've read a lot of real classic uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Um, There was uh, Armour is probably a really good um, sort of really military um, gung-ho, but with with some thought and feeling too um, by John Stakely, I think. Um, also Kurt Vonnegut, um, there's like probably some obvious influences of Robert A. Heinlein as well with Starship Troopers as well. But, um, yeah, there was, there was sort of, I really just love the the setting as well. And as a Star Wars child, I guess, as well, being born in 1973, I grew up in that era of watching these amazing things on screen and just, um, the appeal of the, the technology and the possibilities of what might be out there was has always um, been tremendously appealing to me. So, yeah, I've wanted to write a book with this sort of theme for a long time. And the challenge for me was to find a situation or a setting that would allow it to also be about people. So it's um, it's something that I found that as I've gotten older, I've gotten more and more interested in character-driven stories. So when I was younger, I would see a cool situation and I would think, well, you know, that's that's it. That's that's cool. I'm going to go explore in there. And I, I tended to write more plot driven stuff. And I still really enjoy suspenseful stories. I, I find that um, I've got to have uh, some sort of suspense pulling me through a book. But I my standards have gotten higher for what I need from characters as well. So, yeah, it took me a while to find a story that would allow me to do both, that would let me have some characters that I could really get to grips with, um, characters that would be real people and make interesting choices and ask interesting questions, but also would still be attached to this this simple joy of a future when the technology allows us to do so much uh, and that um, allows us as as human beings to be more than we are in a way by um, uh, by amplifying our decisions and amplifying our abilities. We're not just, you know, a, a human being stuck here on planet Earth in an apartment anymore. We're, we're out there on a spaceship and we can control these incredible uh, beasts of, of starships that can do so much. Um, so, yeah, the, the influences, there's, there's plenty of them. Uh, probably um, the Tripod series by, um, uh, who is it? John Christopher um, wrote the these um, young adult books about the oh of course everyone knows them the tripods, um, and that has uh, the third book in particular um, a, a scene where one of the characters is taken into the alien city, and I found that really inspiring too. Um, just the the way that uh, a human then is is taken into this alien culture all alone and then gets to experience some of it from the other side. So, yeah, those are probably some of the the most obvious influences on the book. Uh, And some of it, too, is just from uh, I I love science fiction, but because I love it so much, I'm also really critical on the science fiction that I read and that I watch. So I will get tremendously annoyed, for example, at a science fiction story that is is 95 percent perfect, but it's got humans aiming the guns. And uh, like I can't (laughs) believe that. In the future, we're going to let humans do anything because we're so uh, fallible. We we can't aim anywhere near as well as as a computer today. We're using drones right now. Um, so, I I you know I, I felt the need to kind of correct the record to a certain degree by writing my own version where I get it right. Um, and of course, that's <laughs> tremendously arrogant. And I'm sure I make all my own mistakes instead. But uh, yeah, that was that was a drive for me as well. 
I have a, a couple of thoughts. First, um, I, I'm still reeling from the shock that John Steakley wrote something other than the book Vampires, which I love, and it's the only thing I know from him. So a quick Google oh, right. search okay. found out that he's that he's known as a science fiction author. <laughs> so, right. No, I, I've not read the Vampires one. Yeah. Um, I love that book. Uh, my other thought on then some again we talked about in our review. Um, so Rob and I, neither one of us, and, and I hate to say this after after the statements that you made, neither one of us are big like sci-fi fans. So I'll, I'll right. be honest, I was a little concerned. You know, there's an astronaut in some some liquid on the cover, and I thought, oh, this might this might be a rough go. But you managed to make it very approachable for people who are not. Um, hardcore sci-fi fans. Is that something you were conscious of when you were writing, or is this just the way the story unfolded? Yeah, that's that's a good question because I I really enjoy reading sci-fi, um, but I kind of prefer the classic stuff where it's uh, simpler in a way. You've got these very broad concepts um, because they were just being explored for the first time in books in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, whereas um, modern sci-fi tends to be um, much more complex, I guess, because we're trying to subvert the subversions of the previous generation who are subverting the ones before that. But uh, So, yeah, the, the story that I wanted to write was always going to be a personal kind of story. So uh, I... I I like watching technology on a screen, but I don't really like reading about um, the nitty gritty of technology. So I was never going to get too much into any of that. Um, But I think that's, you know, no matter what genre you're writing in, there's always a way to do it where the most relevant stuff is, is the personal stuff. And that comes to the fore. So I think whether it's a detective novel or, or a horror novel or whether it's, um, yeah, a science fiction novel. There's there's a way to do that where uh, you, you know, as the writer, you're always looking for the parts of the story that you find the most interesting. So for me, the most interesting parts of a science fiction novel are the way that it can put people into situations that make them that expose the the most important parts of them, and that make them make decisions that maybe they wouldn't have to make in in other circumstances, but. Uh, because of this this scenario they do so it's um yeah it's i'm really glad to hear that it is a personal story and i think that it's probably you know my stuff has always been classified as science fiction even when it's it doesn't have spaceships and aliens in it but that is um it's been a label that my publishers have tried to play down a bit because i tend to write stories that are science fiction in the sense that they set in the modern day world but with some sort of twist to them like if it's if it's Jennifer government then it's a very ultra capitalist world but there's no um, new technology as such there's nothing to really market as um, as a science fiction in the sense of that many people who don't read much science fiction um, think of it as uh, so yeah the people are always going to be the most important in whatever book I write and yeah I hope that's always true uh, it's definitely one of the things that I thought was made it so approachable was that it was less about elaborating on all of the the way things work and more about just um, what's going on with the characters and stuff. So um, absolutely one of my favorite parts of the book was how you structured it like that. Um, I have a kind of a goofy question. Um, yeah. <laughs> because one of the things that you did was like you, 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 you set things up and stuff, but you didn't spend like chapters and chapters explaining the the fine details of things. So um, if I remember correctly, there's not a real specific description of the Providence ship itself. And so in my mind, this is, this is just dorky me the whole time I'm reading it. I'm picturing from mystery science theater 3000, that like dog bone shaped um, ship. So (laughs) do you have, do you have in your mind an image of what the the ship looks like? No, you know, I, I probably don't. Um, if I thought about it, I would probably just picture one of those generic spaceships that's on the cover of almost every um, space opera novel. Um, there must be a couple of artists who just get their living creating new spaceships that are slightly new variations on the old one um, for new books. But it's, yeah, no, it's a description of inanimate objects is something that I've never enjoyed reading about. And then when it was my turn to write books, then I just never found that terribly interesting. So I tended to skip over it. So, yeah, the ship itself, I think you get, yeah, maybe when in the very beginning there's there's a brief description of the different parts of it. But, no, I never, I, I don't outline it because, you know, that's 
to me, that's the, not the important part of the story. It's um, I mean, there's a, a certain contract that you make as the author with the reader, and I think um, my job is to sketch out enough so that there's a, a fully formed story happening in your head. Um, but I leave a lot of it to you as the reader. In fact, one of the things that's really surprised me as an author um, is just discovering how much of the story works best when it is left to the reader and how much you can get away with in a sense where you don't spell it out, uh, but you let the reader create that. Um, and there's um, a skill to it, which I'm still learning uh, to really do that effectively, where you sketch out around a certain area and then the, the reader will will fill in the missing part themselves better than you ever could if you tried to painstakingly describe it. So, yeah, for me, the the actual nitty gritty of, you know, which bits of the spaceship look like what, um, yeah, that, that was never going to be something I was going to delve too far into. So it's uh, interesting times that we're living in. Your book tour um, sadly had to be canceled. Rob and I were very much looking forward to, to catching up with you when you hit Chicago. Um, have you found any interesting ways to, to promote your book in lieu of losing the book tour? Yeah, look, it's kind of funny because being a pretty nerdy guy, I've always done stuff online for my books. And dating back to uh, Jennifer Government, when I, which is 2003, Three, I think, uh, where I decided that um, after my first novel, um, the one before that, Syrup, had come out and had basically sunk without a trace. I had realized that authors need to do something to actually promote their own work because otherwise people never hear about their books. So I had created this web game, Nation States, and it had um, it did really well. It's actually still going today, all this time later. Um, and I'm probably better known for that among um, students and political science majors, at least, than than the books. But it's um, yeah, it's it sort of started me on the path of creating online stuff uh, for my books. So I've I've been quite active in the digital space um, for a long time. But what what happened with this book is that um, my my publishers in different countries realised I wasn't going to be able to do anything except online, and so they all at once started asking me to to do. Um, you know, to tweet this and to tweet that. And it was um, it was like everyone panicked at once and then rushed towards me asking me to tweet things. So um, I feel sorry for my my followers who I sort of poked in the head with the book because I, I felt the need to do something over the past week. Um, so, yeah, for, for this one, I actually created a, um, a Providence game, which you can play at providence.training. So it's a little battle simulator I created where you can um, put yourself in the shoes of the crew. Uh, and I sort of spent a, a couple of weeks playing around with my computer and, and making this thing, which is something I do with the side of my brain that doesn't get much of a workout when I'm writing fiction. And, um, yeah, so there's, um, there's that. Uh, there's... Yeah, there's so much you can do now, and it's quite a crowded space too. But um, it's all a bit strange too in in this age where we're all living in lockdown and we have bigger things to worry about than books. Uh, so it's um, yeah, it's it's a strange time. But uh, if we can get through it with um, with a few good reads and and a, an online game, then I figure that maybe that's helping in some way. You had mentioned um, that there's been a little bit of a gap since we last had a book from you. Um, are you able to give us a time frame on maybe when the next one will appear? Yeah, well, the reason that there is a gap is because I very stupidly spent the years since Lexicon writing four different books at once. So there was uh, terrific fun creatively because I could uh, switch from one to the other. And every time I would get sick of one book, I could jump to the other one. Um, but it's a really good way to get nothing published for a long time. So I finished um, three and a half books last year. And one of them is Providence. Uh, the second one I'm pretty sure will be published the year after this, so 2021. Uh, one of them should probably never be published. And the other one that's a half, I'm, I'm not really sure about. So, yeah, I, I do hope that this long period of zero books will be followed by um, a productive period of lots of books by me, which um, I have actually been working on all this time. It just it doesn't seem like I've been doing much. And I'm thinking my kids probably are wondering what I'm doing upstairs in, in the study all this time. But 
Daddy is actually doing something and, and publishing books, which hopefully will be on the shelves uh, in the near future. Awesome. Well, we want to respect your, your time. We know that you have other stuff coming up uh, basically right now. So I want to thank you for taking the time. I know that we could probably spend another hour picking your brain about stuff, but thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, and thanks for Providence, which we really loved. Oh, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. What a great interview. You're right. We could have probably spent another hour talking to that guy. And and, and maybe maybe next year, maybe when his next book comes out, we'll try to slot ourselves in for a little bit uh, longer slice of interview. But definitely Providence.training. I know I have to rush off to work, <laughs> but I'm assuming Rob is going to uh, be bursting salamanders or, or whatever happens on that site here shortly. Pretty much. That's the next thing I'm doing. Um yeah, I love listening to that guy talk, and uh, uh, I think that next next year what we'll do, this is the tricky thing, so we can get more time with him. You'll schedule an interview, and then I'll schedule one right afterwards. <laughs> so that he's like, I got to go and be like, no, 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 <laughs> you're fine. No, no, Stay no. Right here. We figured this out. We got twice the time. This <laughs> love it, but uh, yeah, um, absolutely excellent. Uh, so. That's wrapping it up for this. Uh, next week we have um, the Grady Hendrix book, uh, the su- the <laughs> <laughs> the Southern Book Club Guide to Slaying Vampires. Yeah, I think right. that's it. You got it right. <laughs> um, by the way, so far so good on that one. I'm almost a quarter of the way in, and it's it's, it's looking good. So that should be a fun one for sure. Awesome! Very excited. Uh, join us next week for that. Until then, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Keep reading.